Hello and welcome. Thank you everyone for being here for History Cafe, paying tribute to Seattle's black landmarks and their namesakes. Thank you everyone for being in the space and thank you to those of you tuning in on the live stream. I'm Sora, I'm the public program specialist here at Mohai. Um, and a couple housekeeping notes before we begin. If you need a restroom, uh, they're just around this green car down the hallway to the left. We're very excited to present History Cafe in partnership with History Link on the third Wednesday of every month. And a brief schedule of events. We're gonna start with a presentation followed by audience Q&A and then there will be an opportunity for a book signing at the end. Tonight, we'll be diving into our city's landmarks and deepening our love for this place that so many of us are lucky to call home. And as part of that, it's important to acknowledge whose land we're on. Here at Mohai, we're on the historic and contemporary lands and waters of the Duwamish, Suquamish, Muckleshoot, and all Coast Salish people. Historically, Native communities were forcibly removed from this city, but today we honor their continued endurance with deep respect and gratitude for their unbroken stewardship of this place. We encourage you to visit the website of local tribes to learn more about the people whose land you're on. And without further ado, I'd love to welcome Kiku Hughes, our partner at History Link, to introduce our lovely speakers tonight. Thank you, everyone. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for, for being here. Um, and thank you for joining us for this very special edition of History Cafe, which we do in partnership with Mohai. Um, and my name is Kiku Hughes. Um, I work for History Link. Um, and today we are so honored to be joined by story educator and historian Mary T. Henry, who is debuting her new book, Tributes, Black People Whose Names Grace Seattle Sites. Um, I'm going to do a, a little introduction of our guests tonight. Um, first of all, of course, we have Mary Henry, um, a retired Seattle Public Schools librarian and author of Tributes, Seattle Public Places Names for Black People, she is the African-American contributing editor to History Link, the archivist for Epiphany Church, and serves on the board of the Seattle Education Foundation. She has served on the board of the Association of King County Historical Organizations and the Seattle Landmarks Preservation Board. She was the editor of the Black Heritage Society newsletter from 1993 to 2003. And of course, she has contributed many articles to both historylink.org and blackcast.org. We also have us with us today Bob Henry, which is Mary Henry's proud son and the husband of Marilyn Henry, the illustrator of uh, Tributes. And um, we have, of course, Marilyn's son Henry, who is a retired Epiphany School math specialist and a master gardener, and her illustrations are featured in Tributes. Um, I'd like to do a quick introduction to the book before I hand it over to Mary. Um, and I, I'm paraphrasing the praise given to it by Stephanie Johnson Tolliver, president of the Black Heritage Society of Washington State. Um, tributes, black people whose name grace Seattle sites is the long-awaited update to Mary's previous work, Tribute, Seattle Public Places Named for Black People. The book is much more than an inventory of places named for black people. It celebrates the lives and significant legacies that contribute to the history of Seattle and King County. Having a sense of place is a key to understanding how we as residents interact with our city and how this city has interacted with its residents. We know that history, we, we, when we know that history, it fundamentally shapes our understanding of places we call home. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Mary Henry to the stage to discuss her new work. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Uh, I want first of all to thank Mohai and History Link for inviting me, and also to you for coming. On many of my trips around the state and in Seattle, I always had these questions. Who, what, 
and why. Who is the person named on a bridge or a road or a building? What did he do? What did he or she do to be so honored? Why isn't there a plaque or something to tell us? When you enter Seattle from the east across Mercer Island, you will be on the Lacey V. Murrow Bridge. <coughs> those of you who know who he was, could you raise your hand? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was appointed director of highways in 1933 and was the older brother of Edward R. Murrow, the radio broadcaster, for those of you who can remember radio. <laughs> he grew up in Edison in Stanford <coughs> County and attended Washington State University. If you are ever in the whole Edison area, you will pass by a modest house with a sign designating it as the home of Edward R. Murrow. I don't remember seeing Lacey's name there, but during the war, he attained the rank of Brigadier General. Sadly, Lacey Murrow, despondent over his health, committed suicide in 1966 in a hotel room in Baltimore. So now you know the man behind the name when you cross the I-90 bridge. <laughs> One day I discovered this wonderful book by James Phillips called Washington State Place Names. It answered a lot of my questions of who and why and what. My dream was to do something similar about Seattle. My first beginning was a series of posters about landmarks named for minority people in Seattle, which were distributed to Seattle schools. Then there was a slideshow. Then my plan was to write a book about Seattle landmarks named for minority people. Then I realized I wouldn't live long enough to do the research to write the book. <laughs> 25 years ago, I published this book, Tribute. Uh, and it, is, it, it contains 22 places named for black people in Seattle along with brief bios of the people. I received a grant from King County to publish it, and it was distributed to all the Seattle schools. I am really indebted to the students at South Shore Middle School, where I was librarian during the 1970s and 80s for alerting me to the fact that they were unaware of the people from whom the places they visited were named. They swam in Edgar Evers School, visited Douglas Truth Library, and Odessa Brown Children's Clinic, but they didn't have a clue. This is what inspired me to write tribute public places named for black people in Seattle. Several years ago, I was encouraged by Georgia McDade and Stephanie Holliver, president of the Black Heritage Society, to update the book. I began research for it with their support, but during the pandemic, the project faltered. The last year, Marilyn, my daughter-in-law, suggested that since I had done the research, she could do the illustrations <laughs> to a day, and we could get a book published before my 99th birthday in November. So I wrote, and she drew for two months. My sons, Bob, 
retired Lakeside teacher, and Neil, retired dean of the School of Journalism at UC Berkeley, in the editing. That was really a family project. And then magically, and I really say magically, History Link offered to publish it. And Marie McCaffrey did a fantastic job of designing the book and the cover. And Mayor Bruce Harrell graciously wrote the foreword. And Leonard Garfield here wrote a very nice blurb. And though we didn't meet our goal, at least it came out before I'm 100. <laughs> this morning, Bob and I went to City Hall and delivered 100 books to the mayor's office. He had ordered 100 books. So we delivered these books to the secretary. And as we were leaving down this long hall to get the elevator back down to the elevator, suddenly the mayor emerged coming down the hall toward us to thank us for the books. And he also talked about what he planned to do with them. Now, because I have a hearing problem, I didn't hear all he said. So later during the answer, uh, question and answer period, you might ask Bob because he heard him. <laughs> and I'd like to say I should mention here that this book does not presume to contain all of the sites. Three were named after the book was sent to the press. And they are the Bertha Pitts Campbell home on 22nd, opened last year year is named for an early civil rights leader and a founding member of the first black sorority. The Seattle School Board voted to rename the Northgate School, which has just been renovated, to the James Baldwin School in honor of the noted author of The Fire Next Time and Go Tell It on the Mountain. Just last month, a street in South Seattle was named Bill Burton Way to honor him for his work with the Rainier Boys and Girls Club. And then just yesterday, I heard that the, a few blocks on East Union are going to be named for the uh, young postman who had the post, post office shop on MLK around the corner and who was murdered last year. I can't remember his name. In my book, there are 53 people whose names are on Seattle sites. And most of these people live or have lived in Seattle and contributed to the life and culture of the city through medicine, sports, art, architecture, music, business, politics, labor, law, and education. Their names are on parks, streets, buildings, a bridge, and other special sites and buildings. Hopefully this book will bring life to the names you see on these sites. It's a little book, but it is hopefully my contribution to the literature of black history in Seattle. 10 of these people are Seattle natives. Three are Garfield graduates, and 10 are internationally or nationally known. Interestingly, there are two couples who each, who each are honored separately for their contributions. Several were born before Seattle was settled, but they are prominent in black history. Some of them were my friends or acquaintances, and I'd like to read portions of their bios. There is a water play area on 20th and Yesler 
and a pathway park which runs from 20th and Jackson almost to Yesler. They are named for Dr. Blanche Leviso. She was one of my very best friends. Dr. Leviso was the first black woman pediatrician in the state and the first medical director of Odessa Brown Children's Clinic, which provides medical, dental, and support services to children in Seattle and King County. It was she who gave the clinic its motto, quality care with dignity. She left her mark on the clinic from the way the staff answered the phone to seeing that the chairs in the waiting room were comfortable. She was a friend and a classmate of Dr. Martin Luther King. In fact, her sister, Juanita, was for a while engaged to him. On his only visit to Seattle, he visited her home. One summer night, after a triumphant victory at the Bridge Center, we were driving home, and she turned to me and said, I don't feel well. Three months later, she died from a fast-growing lung cancer. She was only 59. It was a shock and a great loss. There is a park on Yesler, a fine arts center on Maine, and apartments on Jackson, named for Edwin T. Pratt. One of my friends and neighbors told me that she had always thought that the Pratt Fine Arts Center was an extension of the Pratt Institute in New York. Mr. Pratt was the executive director of the Seattle Urban League. I served on his education committee, and we sat at my family room table designing the triad plan to desegregate the Seattle public schools. Seattle was blanketed in snow on that January night in 1969 when Mr. Pratt was shot and killed in the doorway of his home. He had lived in Seattle only 12 years, yet his leadership in human and civil rights left an imprint on the fabric of life in the city. A committed integrationist, he believed that the problems of race could only be solved through integrated efforts. The triad plan became a turning point and landmark in the continuing struggle against de facto segregation. He also conducted quiet negotiations with the University of Washington, urging the school to improve minority opportunity. In housing, he consistently pushed for integrated neighborhoods. A catalyst and a negotiator, Mr. Pratt led Seattle on a higher road in race relations. There is a center at the University of Washington campus named for Gertrude Peoples, who was a dear friend and a bridge partner. She is the founder of the country's first academic support office for college student athletes. For over 40 years, she was the mother, friend, and academic advisor to athletes at the University of Washington. In 1973, she joined the football coaching staff on their recruitment trips and became the first woman athletic recruiter at a major university. In 2011, she was the first woman and first non-athlete to be honored as a Husky legend. There are scholarships in her name at the school. Dr. Homer Harris was one of Seattle's most handsome men. 
and a classmate of my husband's at Meharry Medical College. It was his encouragement which prompted our family to move to Seattle. I had a friend who always said that the sight of him would just make your day. <laughs> There's a park at the corner of 24th and Howell named in his honor and placed along a wall as an artful timeline of Seattle's black history. Dr. Harris, a second generation native, was the first black dermatologist at the state, in the state and was honored by the Black Heritage Society as a pioneer in the field. Harris attended Garfield High School and became the first black captain of the football team in 1933. After completing his training in dermatology, he returned to Seattle to begin his practice. Having been refused office space in the medical dental building due to the color of his skin, he came home and called his friend and prominent Seattle, Seattleite Stimson Bullock about the matter. Now I happen to know this because I did Dr. Harris's oral history and he told me all of this. Very shortly thereafter, the building manager came to the home and offered him office space. He became the first black physician to have an office in the medical dental building and opened doors for other minority professionals. There are many others that I did not know, but found their stories compelling. Alice Ball grew up near 23rd and Union and graduated from the University of Washington in 1914. She was the daughter and granddaughter of the first black professional photographers in Seattle. Alice Ball was a chemist who isolated an oil to give relief to leprosy patients. And it was the only help for them until the 1940s. There's a delightful little park in the Greenwood neighborhood named for her. And I believe the University of Washington had some influence in the Seattle Park Department about naming that park for her. Denise Hunt was an architect who had a major influence on the practices that shaped the waterfront, Benaroya Hall and Westlake Plaza, and who was also instrumental in the formation of the Northwest African American Museum. She was the first black woman in the United States to serve as president of a local chapter of the American Institute of Architects. There are scholarships in her name at the University of Washington. One of my favorites is Tyree Scott, a leader who opened doors for women and minorities in the construction industry. He led dramatic demonstrations shutting down major construction sites throughout Seattle to protest the impossible position of minority workers. They ran a bulldozer into an open pit at the University of Washington and marched on the flight apron of SeaTac Airport to halt traffic. These demonstrations precipitated the first federal imposition of affirmative action upon local governments and industries. And it was because the United States Department of Justice filed suit against the unions in 1969. So, arts, health care, education, you name it. Black hands have made an imprint on Seattle's landscape. Hopefully, as you pass by these buildings, sit in their parks, and drive down their streets, you will remember these people 
and their contribution. Thank you. Now I think we're gonna be able to open it up for questions and we have um, people that have mics that they can run to the audience. So feel free to raise your hand and, and I'll call on you and Sora will run a mic over to you. <laughs> oh sure, right there. How long did it take you to write the book? That was funny. How long did it take to write the book? Your great grandson wants to know how long it took you to write the book. <laughs> Sorry, what? Your great grandson, Benny, wants to know how long it took you to write the book. Uh, well, with the research and the writing. Thank you, Benny. That happens to be my great grandson. <laughs> with the research and the writing, it probably took over a year. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, I think we have one right over there. Um, hi. So uh, my daughter was actually the third grader who proposed naming Alice Ball Park after Alice Ball and started the campaign to get that park named for her. Uh, but because it was named after it's designed, there's nothing but her name on the park. Um, and she's now working to try to get some grants to put in some public signage or art there to make it more obvious who Alice Ball is. Since you've seen so many of these sites, in your opinion, what is the most effective way to communicate someone's story at a location so that people who visit it know more than just the name? Wow. <laughs> You, I am hard of hearing, so you, this is my interpreter. Can you cut my mic, please? So her daughter <laughs> uh, was instrumental in getting the Alice Ball Park oh, started. Oh, wonderful! And, <laughs> and her daughter and fourth grader, a four, as a fourth grader, um, and her daughter is now trying to find out ways to get better and more uh, prominent signage uh, describing the, Very name, good. the person and the park. So what do you think, she, the lady says, the question, is, the question is, what do you think should be done or can be done to uh, elevate uh, these parks and places um, and explaining on site uh, what these places well, are Well, I about. just think there should be a little sign or a plaque or something that gives but some sort of description true. about who are these people? Why were they honored? So what do you suppose would be the avenue to having that happen? They have to go to the park department. First of all, to get the parks about the buildings, I don't, I don't know. But it would be a great <laughs> effort. Does that get to your point? Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, was there one in there? Yeah. I, in response to that uh, request, I would suggest looking at Flo Ware Park and Homer Harris Park. Both of those parks incorporate uh, significant information about the people that they honor. So we have examples. <laughs> good signage also describing who uh, these individuals were. Hi, Mrs. Henry. Um, you wrote about a lot of other people. What about your own story? What did you, what did you go through in and what kind of a park should we make for you? No, I'm just saying, I'd love to hear your story. So, the gentleman wants to know about your story. 
the story of you. And what park or place <laughs> would be an appropriate... <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Bob wants to know what we should name after you. <laughs> oh, I tell you, there is one something named after me. There is a, a media room at the Ida Culver uh, home on Broadview. It's called the Mary Henry Media Room. <laughs> but and that's because I serve on the Seattle Education Foundation uh, Committee. Uh, uh, and we sponsored that and helped develop that retirement home. One of three that we helped to develop. But she would not let me draw her picture. I'd like to uh, make a contribution that I'm sure you're probably aware of, but in case you're not, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Perkins, Jr., and I've been retired for several years. But when uh, I came here, I was teaching about a decade ago, and then I started consulting, writing grants for different community organizations out here, and I brought several millions of dollars to the streets of Seattle to, at community grassroots levels. But one of my most interesting finds during my research when I was, you know, I would go to Antioch or a community college and then I spent this wonderful time in Seattle. It's one of the most incredible places I've ever lived in in my life. You can easily fall in love with this here highly densely populated town. But what I found, um, I got a grant um, and I was hired with working with this woman, Diane Ferguson, who was head in the Central Senior Center at the time. And, we had a grant to preserve the stained glasses, glass windows at the first AME church here in Seattle. And uh, under my research, uh, as I was in there, you know, uh, scouting the place, and I had some of the people help me to move the benches from the pews at the higher level. And what I uncovered was William Gross. Now, how many people are aware of William Gross? He purchased the central district land that, that started the central district he, when he gave Henry Yesler a thousand gold pieces. So when I'm looking at, then I went to Lakeview Cemetery, I spent a lot of time there and I saw all of the original pioneers and the whole Gross family is up there. William Gross was an ex-slave who became free and he came here to Seattle. Uh, but to make a long story short, what, what I uncovered when we moved them benches back and it's probably still there, William Gross was a Freemason, and his signature are on those stained glasses, him, his wife, and his daughter, all of them like they're at Lakeview Cemetery. So there's a research project for, that needs to be told. I'm retired, I'm doing too much, but William Gross was such a fascinating character in the Seattle area. He founded the Central District, and there's much more. There's so much untold stories here. I applaud you for bringing this out because when I came here, I saw these parks, but I didn't know who the people were. So I'm gonna stop now, but I said that there are still a lot of untold stories here. Even the archives at the University of Washington Library, I looked at some of the newspapers that are not digitized that was run in the Central District. And I uncovered just so many different people who have been up here. And it's just incredible. So thank you very much. And I look forward to buying your book. <laughs> All right, our next question comes from the live stream. We have a listener in Berkeley, California, who would like to know where you come up with the energy at age 99 to keep digging, keep writing, and keep exploring. Did you get that question? I didn't hear a question. <laughs> Neil, your brother. <laughs> what did he say? Will you repeat my brother's question, please? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, at 99, where do you come up with the energy to keep digging, keep writing, and keep exploring? So this, this uh, question comes from afar. Uh, from, from a gentleman by the name of Neil Henry. And he wants to know, where do you come up with the energy to do this writing, to do this walking, to do all the things that you do? Where do you find the energy for that? He would like some of that. 
bridge. <laughs> I play bridge. <laughs> Hi, this was incredible. So um, I do historical research for my dissertation, and I would like to know what's your process so people who are interested in this can discover their own stories, you know, with people, um, yeah, in their own communities. So could you talk about how you did the research, like your method? Yeah. yeah. So he's a history um, uh, researcher himself, and he, oh. would, he would like to know what your process is as you research. How did you go about choosing and then where did your research take you? Well, in, back in, in 1997, when this book, first book was published, I had to do it through interviews, and I had to do it through a lot of research. This book was easier because of technology, but uh, I've done a lot of oral histories for, black, his, for uh, a black heritage society, and I've done a lot of writing about black people for uh, History Link and for blackpast.org. So that research I already had done. So, uh, but today it's much easier because of technology. Back in those days, you had to go find the person or find somebody who knew the person. But now it's, it's pretty much easier. Plus the University of Washington Library, you, you dig, dug into just oh, files yes. and yeah. oh, yeah. records and yeah. photographs. And, yeah. I had a question. Um, I'm just, I was born here and my parents moved here. Um, my mom did when she was five and it was a very different time 70 years ago. Um, and being black in Washington State. So my question to you is, when going through this research and discovering certain landmarks that were um, people that were uh, black or BIPOC descent, did you have any pushback when trying to get that information and confirming information when discovering that it was from someone who was a bi from the BIPOC community? Did you come across or go through any of that with your research is my question. Um, let me make sure I understand your question. Are you asking whether she had pushback or resistance in gaining the research? Because she's she discovering needed? truth of people who were black that contribute to that. And maybe that was a secret and then, and I don't know if it was a secret and then you're now telling it. I'm just wondering when discovering the truth, did you get pushback from others when finding out the truth of different landmarks that were indeed a history of the black community and BIPOC people? So did you find or have any resistance or pushback from um, individuals or groups of people, uh, pushback or resistance for your, from, towards your research? Did you have any problems digging no, I, I really haven't. I, there was one case, but it was not with the book. It was something else. And I had done a, an article for a history, history Link about this person. And the family got very upset about it because they did not want it to be on History Link, but this was a public figure. So I got very upset. So I called my son, the dean, at the journalism school to ask him, was, was, was I wrong? And he said, no, he was a public figure and that I could have done it. But the family is still pretty angry with me and I'm sorry about it. <laughs> That's the only time. Is nobody going to ask him about no. what the mayor said he's going to do with the book? <laughs> There's the question right there. <laughs> so what did the mayor, am I up? So um, as my mother described, we were uh, this morning just delivering books. <laughs> I just want to do a delivery and get out and go to the next things. But as we're departing, the mayor approaches us and he just comes 
shakes her hand and tells her how wonderful it was that this book is out and how ordering 100 of them is going to be a gift um, to a number of people who will be coming through the office, vig visiting dignitaries, um, people who would, who would appreciate knowing that this city is built on many people from many backgrounds um, and that uh, it's, it's a proud history and these, number, these individuals and more um, uh, are, are the reason for that pride. Um, yeah, that was, he, he, he began talking about that this book evoked for him um, the griot um, uh, phenomenon or story in, in African tradition. The griot is the storyteller who carries on the stories of the, the tribe or the people um, and it's handed down, that those stories are handed down generation to generation to generation. Uh, as most historical ancient cultures, Homer was a griot in his own way. The uh, and ancient rabbis and, and, the, and various holy people were griots of their time and places. And so he sees this person as a griot, <laughs> a griot. He wrote a beautiful uh, forward for the book. Very, very lovely. He was very gracious. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody got a question for the illustrator? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Hi, great grandma. I was wondering what the most enjoyable part of writing the book was. What was the most enjoyable part of writing your book? That would be. Uh, your other great grandchild. Your other grand, great grandchild. <laughs> Thank you, Darrow. That's my other great grandson. <laughs> the greatest joy was to get it done. <laughs> but I think you also enjoyed um, just the, the discovery. Um, of, well, I, of I these enjoyed the, the, the interplay with these two and my other son. I mean, it was just a great family project and we all had input in it and I thought that was just great. Yeah, great. Yeah. Before you in the front. Can we buy the book here tonight? Can we buy the book here tonight? Can we buy the book here tonight? So what? Can we buy the book here tonight? Yes. Oh, yes, of course you can. They've got plenty of books to, <laughs> to buy, plenty. And I would love to sign them. My grandsons enjoyed your book, and especially the tribute to Garfield Bandleader, who has influenced so many young people to follow their dreams in jazz. And of course, there's other people that have established a lot of uh, fame for Seattle in music, but they especially like that tribute. So thank you for doing that. Um, Susan's son enjoyed, um, the, enjoyed reading the book, especially um, the, the message about Clarence Acox uh, uh, from yes. Garfield High School. Yes. Thank you. And Clarence Acox is one of the few in this book that's still living. Gertrude, Clarence, uh, Lenny who was the Lenny, other one? Lenny There's Wilkins. A, uh, Larry Gossett. And Lenny Wilkins. And Lenny Wilkins, yeah. Many people in the community, So. many people in the community are, are aware of the Bridge Club and the ladies <laughs> from Older Seattle, older CD that get together. Is anybody capturing the stories of the ladies and the history of that bridge club so you, could, you don't lose those stories and the history that those women have and have developed in the CD? Um, so I just hope somebody's doing a project on that because I'm aware my family, I've lived here forever, and then my family grew up with the Gertrude Peoples and some of the ladies that are in that group, so it would be terrible if those stories were lost and not shared with some kind of documentation. 
so this was an observation of that um, it, would, it would be appropriate that the stories of the ladies um, in, in your bridge club, this, the one that, that, you, that you invited, you, if you go to their homes and such, um, I forgot, what is the name of the club? There's a bridge club at the senior center. The, oh, the senior center. You're not talking about Ladams. Are you, are you talking about Ladams? They know about that. You know about Tell us. The senior center. The senior center. I got them. Sorry, right behind you. First of all, Mary Henry is a mean bridge machine. You are a mean bridge machine. You are a mean bridge machine. <laughs> you don't uh, mess up your bit around her. And I'm a, a junior wannabe bridge player. Um, but to Chris's um, question, Mary Henry belongs to several bridge, notable bridge, black bridge groups. One is La Dames, which is all women, no men. <laughs> Um, are, is she with um, your Lietta King? Lietta King, which Ida Wiles, and these are all an unbelievable bridge players. And Mary Henry seriously is a mean bridge playing machine. I am not exaggerating. So um, I encourage people to take up bridge. My mom is a bridge player as well. And I've been trying to recruit my cousins to join, um, it really is fun. Oh, the illustrator, please, you just really outdid yourself. That, the illustrations of that book are just amazing. They're like little portraits. I mean, really, that is, and your mother-in-law loves you so, so much. I know you already know that. And of course, Mary Henry's just a prima donna, diva, a writing machine. So well, she's my mom for for over a, uh, for over fifty years. Yeah. So I couldn't say no. <laughs> the bridge world wants to convey their respects and their oh. and their fear <laughs> of your game. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so this question is not for Marilyn, who's my aunt and did the illustrations, but but still for Mary. But what, what was that like, Mary, for you to see the drawings as, each, as, as they were coming along? What was that like for you to see that, see that come to life, having the drawings for the book? Or what was that like for Mary? Please, you do. Uh, you know, I'm going it's to a question for Mary. And what, oh. uh, her reaction to seeing the drawings come to life. Adam wants to know, what, what was it like to see the drawings come to life? in your writing of the book, that you wrote the, the, the bios, and what was it like seeing the drawings of those bios as they came to life? Of uh, Marilyn? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, we have dinner twice a week together, and each one of our dinners, she would bring two of the drawings that she had done, and of course, they were just beautiful. And so we'd say, oh, how wonderful. Oh, this is just going great. And then I would show her what I had done. And so little by little by little, we got it done. Except um, Homer Harris. <laughs> she did not like the way I drew Homer Harris. I said, he is handsome. She's, he's more handsome he's than He's more that. handsome than that. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> I had to do it three times. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, they were all just fine. <laughs> I would like to introduce you to the person who made all this possible. Marie, would you stand up? Marie McCaffrey. We met at, at the, I was married to Walt Crowley, and Walt and I um, would host once on every Thursday a group of people that 
built History Link, and so that was where the concept came from. We met for about a year, and Mary Henry was part of that group, and um, so, so she built our early African American history on History Link, and has sort of guided us through that. And um, the thing about uh, so Walt loved Mary, and I also. So you know, wanted to um, show our respect to and give you this gift. So and plus, if you know Mary, no one ever can say no to Mary. <laughs> I have a question. Or, um, um, how long did it take you to illustrate each photo? Because I remember coming home from sc school um, and seeing you like drawing. So how long did it take for you to do each drawing? Thank you for the question, Natalie. This is my granddaughter. Um, <laughs> last year, she and her twin brother would come to my house after school, and we would have a snack. And I would show her some of the drawings that I was doing. and. Um, Natalie, a, a sort of a budding artist herself, was very excited to see them just sort of emerge from my pen, and um, she, she was very encouraging. Uh, um, Natalie, I, I did two a day, and I, at that time I was, I, I am retired, but at that time, I, right now I'm, I'm substitute teaching, but uh, that year I didn't do anything except to enjoy the grandchildren and my children, and um, I had more time, and a particular time of the day was in the morning when the, when the light was good is when I did my drawings and, and Natalie and Ben approved of them in the afternoons. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for that, Nat. Hi, I would just like to acknowledge Gertrude Peoples who is here this evening, whose name came up a couple of times and you, uh, Mary included a bit of her bio. So Gertrude, if you'd stand up, I think we'd all appreciate. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, if there's no more questions, or do we have one more? No. All right, um, I think we were able to, so the books are available in the store. Um, you can buy them from the Mohai store back there. Um, and Mary is amenable to signing, um, is that correct? You I are, brought a pen. You are amenable, you're amenable to signing books? Mm -hmm. Yes. Great, yeah. So I think um, Sora's gonna take it away and then um, we can get set up for the signing. And thank you all for, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Mary, and thank you to History Link for partnering on this. Um, before we get to the book signing, um, if you'd like to help us continue to create great programming, it would be really great if you could please take our survey. Uh, my lovely colleague Phaedra over here is waving some QR codes. Um, you can enter a raffle if you do it, so we'd really appreciate that. Um, please join us for our next History Cafe on March 15th, which will be creating a hopeful future for the Puget Sound. And that'll be on March 15th with David B. Williams. And finally, please make sure to check out our new traveling exhibit, or new temporary exhibit here in the Walker Gallery, which is From the Ground Up, Black Architects and Designers. And thank you to the Ferguson Foundation for making that possible. So without further ado, please join us for the book signing. And thank you again. <laughs>